So our speaker tonight is Martin Menz. He's a University of Michigan graduate student studying domestic life at hunter-gatherer ceremonial centers during the Woodland period. He received his undergraduate and master's degree from the University of South Florida and has worked at numerous sites throughout Florida and Georgia, including Crystal River, Kolomoki, and now Letchworth Mounds. So thank you again for joining us, Marty. I'll stop sharing and let you take it away. All right, so can everyone hear me? And uh, you guys can all see that, so I should probably move to the actual presenter mode or the, the slideshow. Okay, um, so we're good to go. Yep. People can see slides. All right. Yep. Well, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, as uh, as Jamie mentioned, I'm Martin Men, so I am a, uh, a PhD student at the University of Michigan, um, and I have been working uh, at the Letchworth site in Northwest Florida. So this is near Tallahassee uh, for the last few years doing my dissertation research. So uh, in this presentation, I'm going to discuss my research uh, there at Letchworth. Um, and so Letchworth is a woodland period ceremonial center near Tallahassee uh, in, you know, in northern Florida, uh, kind of in the panhandle. Uh, and the focus of my dissertation is habitation at ceremonial centers, particularly at Letchworth. But I think that there are some broad lessons that we can take from my research at Letchworth and kind of uh, use them to think about some of these other ceremonial centers and really help us understand the process of village aggregation and village formation in the Gulf Coastal Plain and kind of more generally. So I'm going to begin with a discussion of kind of like some some uh, regional archaeological context, you know, the normal kind of like culture history stuff, uh, and then move on to some theoretical issues that my research is addressing uh, related to ceremonial center occupation. Then I'm going to move on to discuss some of the results from my recent field work. Uh, I guess not too recent. It's been like over two years now. Uh, boy, time flies. Um, and uh, and and discuss kind of like what the the results from this field work tell us about Letchworth, um, specifically related to kind of these two domains that I outline in the title, settlement and subsistence, and uh, and then get into kind of uh, how how this helps us understand understand Letchworth's development throughout its history, um, and really importantly how it differed from neighboring ceremonial centers and what what Letchworth kind of says about the process of village aggregation. Um, you know, uh, uh, kind of in a comparative sense. So to start off with um, the woodland period, the time period that I'm discussing really saw the proliferation of ceremonial centers throughout the Gulf Coastal Plain, uh, as well as further inland. So Letchworth is not on the coast, so it, it is further inland. Um, so these sites are characterized by a few common features. Um, some of them uh, are really the, the first kind of like the biggest one that is most noticeable really is the presence of usually multiple mounds. Uh, so at least one platform mound frequently, um, and then uh, maybe one or two smaller kind of uh, burial mounds or mounds used for other purposes. Um, but some of these sites also I mean, contain, you know, uh, a much larger amount of mounds than that. Uh, sometimes multiple platform mounds and uh, pretty numerous burial mounds. On some on some occasions, um, so woodland period centers also frequently contain plazas. So these big open areas that are kind of bracketed by mounds and evidence of habitation that would have served as large open areas for people to gather together uh, to observe kind of like ceremonies. And in the, the case of just kind of like hunter gatherer aggregation, to just kind of you know come together uh, for parts of the year um, to visit with kind of like more uh, you know distantly related kin or even kind of people that aren't related at all, uh, you know, to exchange goods from kind of like different environments and, uh, you know, meet, meet potential uh, mates, things like that. Um, so then uh, finally, these sites usually also contain kind of extensive middens and artifact scatters. And so this, this aspect of the fact that we have these middens and artifact scatters at a lot of these sites has led archeologists to interpret um, some of these sites as villages, which housed in some cases, relatively large populations. So like uh, Crystal River is probably an example that, that many of you are familiar with, it's a little closer to uh, kind of your neck of the woods. Um, that has been kind of like a pretty, uh, you know, well-established as being kind of like a, a larger village throughout the time period that we're gonna be talking about, talking about today. So, um, 
Woodland period ceremonial centers along the eastern part of the uh, the Gulf Coast um, were generally generally occupied um, in three main phases. So this is the Deptford, so you can see kind of over here, uh, Swift Creek and Weedon Island phase, uh, Weedon Island one phases. Um, and these really correspond uh, to the middle and early late woodland periods in kind of like the broader kind of like Eastern North American culture history. So these sites are usually associated with diagnostic artifacts, especially pottery. Um, so Deptford, you have this kind of like, you know, um, uh, check stamp pottery. Then with uh, Swift Creek, you have this kind of distinctive um, what's called Swift Creek complicated stamp pottery. So with both of these, there is uh, basically a stamped uh, design that you're putting into wet clay, making an impression before you fire it. Um, and then in Weedon Island one, we move on to kind of like a, a you know greater diversity of vessel forms. Um, and then you have a lot of uh, like more like incised and punctated decoration. Um, this is where you also see a lot of these um, kind of like really interesting effigy vessels that have been interred in burial mounds. Um, so um, with these three different um, with these three different phases, you can see here in this map um, that you have kind of a distribution of the of the ceramic type as well as a couple of key sites that are important to these phases. You'll notice here uh, Letchworth is located in the Weedon Island one uh, and associated with Weedon Island one here. That's kind of been the prevailing view of the site, you know, for basically as long as archaeologists have really been working there. Um, but uh, as we'll get into kind of some of the recent field work and radiocarbon dates and stuff like that that I've got from uh, from Letchworth really demonstrates that uh, it seems like a majority of the occupation uh, actually was occurring a little bit earlier than that um, during the uh, Deptford and especially the Swift Creek phases. Uh, but also some weed now, to be fair. <clears throat> so getting into some of the kind of like broader theoretical issues. Um, one of the problems that I really want to address with my dissertation research is the view that woodland period ceremonial centers are that they represent permanent villages occupied by sedentary people. You know, this may be the case uh, for, for some sites, but you know, the jury's still out on Letchworth, I guess. Uh, so research at other centers, so like Crystal River um, and others on the coast indicates that year, year round occupation at these sites associated with resource rich locales. So again, because we're on the coast, we're talking about these kind of like estuarine environments where you have fresh water that's coming out to meet salt water and creates a really productive environment, right? Um, in contrast, previous work at Letchworth, um, as well as some other kind of sites in the interior, right, showed that artifact and feature densities were lower at Letchworth. They're appreciably lower even than other inland sites. Um, so we have you have fewer artifacts, fewer features across Letchworth. Um, and it indicates that few people probably live there. Um, definitely fewer than, <laughs> than, than what's estimated for a place like Crystal River. Um, so these findings are at, odd with, uh, at odds really with the exceptional size and complexity of the mounds at Letchworth. So as we'll, we'll get into, Letchworth has like a 50 foot tall platform mound. Um, one archeologist estimated that there were, you know, more than 20 other mounds at the site. Um, before kind of like modern uh, destruction by, you know, like modern land use, uh, previous landowners. Um, and it's really interesting because Letchworth kind of dwarfs most of these other ceremonial centers in the region, even the coastal ones, um, with the exception of Kolomoki in Southwest Georgia, um, at least in terms of the, the size of, of mounds. So um, my research really seeks to understand the processes that led to village aggregation or not at Woodland Period ceremonial centers. Um, so at, at, at Letchworth, I'm really interested in the or not, right? Um, so I, I approach this by first kind of like foregrounding some of the ambiguities and how we distinguish seasonally mobile hunter-gatherers from settled villagers archeologically. Um, so uh, hunter characterizations of hunter-gatherer sociality are usually based on like ethnography, ethnographic research. Um, so these are contemporary foragers in kind of like marginal environments, um, or we should say maybe like, you know, uh, like somewhat less, uh, less ecologically productive environments. Um, and they fail to capture the variability of hunter-gathered lifeways. Um, and this is really evident when we compare these kind of like case studies with prehistoric populations that inhabited, you know, places like the Southeast, uh, coastal and inland, right? Um, which are highly kind of like ecologically productive. So over the last several decades, uh, Southeastern archaeologists have really shown that, you know, relatively mobile people 
um, exhibited many of the social practices previously assumed to represent kind of like formative village cultures. Um, this includes kind of like complex social organization, uh, institutions that govern interpersonal interactions, formal settlement layouts, monumentality, complex ceremonialism. Um, and in addition to that, settled villagers are also kind of mobile themselves, right? Um, so like, you know, fissioning uh, or kind of like the, the breakup of and movement, oh, ew. I moved the thing. There we go. Uh, the breakup and uh, movement of village segments are also noted in ethnographic and archeological cases of village societies. So this kind of like, um, almost like dichotomy that archeologists draw between, you know, mobile and subtle people is kind of a misnomer. And we've recognized that for a long time. I mean, we've, you know, at least in, uh, when we discuss this stuff in like articles and papers and stuff, we, we all recognize that mobility is kind of a spectrum. Um, so here I'm kind of trying to kind of put, you know, push on that a little bit more. Um, so for this research, I defined um, archeological correlates from several different models of ceremonial center occupation and compared these with uh, new data from survey and excavations at Letchworth to try and see kind of which model is the best fit for Letchworth's occupation and kind of then pulling on some of those threads to see kind of like what, what makes Letchworth a little bit different from other places. So alternative models for, the cer for ceremonial center occupation can be drawn from large earthwork sites of the Midwest and Mid-South. Uh, so this is like, you know, the large Hopewell earthwork sites um, in like the central Scioto in Ohio, uh, the Pinson site um, where you have evidence. Uh, th so th these kind of, uh, these sites, so um, Hopewell and Pinson, these are sites where you have like large, like really massive scale monumentality, but evidence for habitation is sparse. And the evidence that we do have for habitation, these sites is, is pretty dispersed, um, not, not really nucleated, right? Um, so I'm interested in investigating the everyday lives of people at Letchworth, um, their settlement patterns and practices, and why they may have resisted or modified the kind of like mechanisms of village formation that we see in action at other Southeastern ceremonial centers like Crystal River. Um, and I think that this, that this research, not to maybe grandstand too much, but I think this provides some really important evidence for um, how this process worked in our region and how this uh, can be kind of compared or how it compares with other world regions where, we, where we're seeing kind of the emergence of, of villages. So are the mechanisms of village aggregation, uh, village formation um, the same uh, in the Southeast as kind of what we would see in like the Near East? Um, I'm, I'm, hint, maybe not, right? Um, so here I'll go into talking about uh, the site itself, Letchworth Mounds. Um, so Letchworth is located uh, here. Um, it's a, you know, a little bit east of, uh, of Tallahassee, uh, kind of between Tallahassee and Monticello. Um, it's just to the south of Lake Miccosukee, which is kind of this really large, I mean, this is like 10 kilometers north to south. So it's a pretty big, uh, what's called a prairie lake. So these are uh, large kind of like shallow lakes, really more like a wetland before uh, a lot of them were impounded for like recreational fishing and boating and stuff like that. Um, and what's really interesting is that this karstic landscape, you know, you have a bunch of sinkholes and um, there's an example actually really recently in Tallahassee where Lake Jackson, um, its name associated with another famous archeological site, uh, drained kind of like really dramatically over a very short amount of time because a sinkhole basically opened up in the lake and just drained all the water out of it. Um, and so you have these kind of like periodic cycles of, of kind of like drainage and then the sinkhole gets plugged up and then water reaccumulates in the basin and then that happens over and over again. So it's like this really kind of like dynamic landscape but also very productive because it's basically almost like, uh, think of it maybe as, uh, almost like an, uh, like, you know, it's a, it's a large interior wetland, right? Um, and it's, as I said, very shallow. So a lot of kind of like area for, you know, wetland plants, which is gonna be something very crucial um, that we'll get into a little bit later in the talk. So at Letchworth, um, the, the feature that kind of dominates the entire site is this large 50 foot platform mound, mound one. Um, and uh, this, is, um, this is kind of interesting. Um, the site has been known for uh, been known for a little while, um, but there hasn't really been a whole lot of archaeological work there until um, kind of the state was getting involved in thinking about uh, thinking about buying it. Um, so um, you have uh, a sketch map here 
from Calvin Jones um, from 19, the 1980s. Um, you know, so Calvin Jones went out there, surveyed the site and noted that in addition to mound one right here, that there may have been as many as 27 other mounds at the site. He noted that several of these were destroyed by previous landowners um, and others like these ones are gonna be located if they still exist are located outside of the current boundaries of the state park. Um, interesting too, uh, unlike most other mound centers dating to this time, um, some of the, the mounds at Letchworth, um, the ones that weren't destroyed, seem to have avoided kind of substantial looting because, uh, because they're not located on a river. People are, I would imagine that some people are pretty familiar with C.D. Moore uh, and his gopher steamboat going up rivers and him just like digging up every burial mound that he could find. Well, um, he couldn't do that because uh, Lake Miccosukee is kind of a major source for like the St. Mark's River. Uh, but it goes underground actually through that same karstic landscape that I mentioned. Um, so no little paddle boat could get up here because uh, because the river goes underground, right? Um, so uh, so that actually kind of protected them. So a lot of the mounds that we're going to talk about, um, as far as I know, have not been excavated, uh, at least not by a professional archaeologist or in any antiquarian that wrote about it. Um, so, so kind of a, 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 a another unique, I don't know, feather in the cap for Letchworth. Um, so uh, there has been uh, some some uh, like archaeological field work out there by the state, um, large shovel test survey that I'll talk about here in a second. But um, some of the main features of the site are, in addition to the mounds, this kind of like plaza area that's devoid of artifacts and a large artifact scatter south of Mound One, that is you know about a half kilometer in diameter, right? Um, so uh, here, just kind of uh, for some fun history, this is a photo of. Um, uh, Yarborough and Simpson on top of Mound One uh, in the 1930s. So you, just to kind of give uh, some scale, person for scale, uh, to the size of this mound. So people have known about it for a little while. I think Hale Smith um, mentioned it in in a dissertation or, or another publication, um, but really not a lot of work done there until you know starting in the 70s, but really mostly in kind of like the 80s, 90s, and, and today. So. Um, when the state purchased uh, Letchworth, there was uh, the previous landowners, so the ones who potentially like, you know, bulldozed some of these mounds, which would have been uh, really important. Um, they had a large artifact collection um, you know, from surface collections across the site. Uh, so this is kind of our first uh, idea. This was our first idea um, of kind of like what, when the site dated to. So, the fact that we have this really complex uh, platform mound out at Letchworth, 50 feet tall, led some early researchers out at the site to think that maybe this was like a large Mississippian site. And I say early again, talking about like the 70s and the 80s, um, to think that this was going to be a Mississippian site because that's kind of, you know, the prevailing kind of uh, knowledge at the time, which is that you have a large platform mound, it's Mississippian. But then um, when uh, <clears throat> when uh, somebody actually uh, analyzed some of these, uh, some of this pottery, um, you have, it's like, you know, Swift Creek, Wakulla, like it's all woodland period um, decorated types, right? A lot of them dating to kind of this Wheaton Island one phase that we mentioned before, um, which led, uh, you know, most archaeologists to basically say, all right, well, it's a, it's a Wheaton Island site uh, for the most part. So then fast forward um, several years, we've got uh, uh, a couple of other Project. So I mentioned a large shovel testing survey out at the site. This was conducted by Lewis Tesser um, around, I think, in like 2003, um, 2002, 2003. So a ton of, of shovel testing and some controlled excavations across the site um, that kind of showed us where the artifacts were, where the artifacts weren't, uh, basically allowed us to define that, that habitation area in the plaza. Um, then uh, later on, there was a, uh, a, a field school out there. Um, so you see one of the excavations there. Um, but you know, this is all without the, without the benefit of remote sensing. So um, a site with uh, really low artifact density where you're digging in this kind of sand, it's like needle in a haystack, whether or not you're going to find you know, cool diagnostic artifacts, a feature that you can date, things like that. So most of the, uh, the you know, excavations, a lot of these one by twos that had been previously excavated at the site, not super fruitful. Um, then fast forward to kind of the early 20 teens, 
And you had, ar uh, again, archeologists from the state that became uh, more interested in kind of expanding some of the shovel testing and previous work that had been done out there, but also investigating the mounds, which is uh, very cool um, because we have some data. This is uh, Dan Seinfeld and Charlie Harper that worked out there as well as uh, I think help from Dan Bigman um, that uh, ran several kind of like remote sensing techniques and coring um, of, of some of these mounds. Um, so what we now know from their work about mound one is that we have what looks like a, a three stage um, kind of like, you know, uh, like construction history uh, for the mound. Um, so we've also got evidence that there are different soils being used on some of the kind of like different components of the mound, these different flanks. And the other thing that you'll notice too, which I think is very interesting um, about this mound in the contours here, is that it's, you've got these flanks coming off to the east, to the west, to the south, and then this ramp coming off to the north. Um, I think some people have said that it kind of reminds them of a bird. You know, uh, I, I think people say that about Poverty Point's Big Mound too. Um, but I really think that it looks more like, uh, more like an equal armed cross um, when seen from above. Um, and you have some directional symbolism potentially built into the structure of the mound and a three-tiered construction. So um, in my opinion, it's kind of like, you know, the, the southeastern cosmos in like physical form. Um, but you know, that's maybe getting a little too uh, out in front of myself, I guess. Um, I don't know if people have questions about that or comments, something at the end, if you agree, I think that that's probably, that's probably a little bit better than a bird, in my opinion. Um, we'll see what y'all think. Um, in addition, there was also one um, unit that was placed, I think on the Southern toe of the mound uh, that got one of the first radiocarbon dates that we actually had for Letchworth. Um, so this is uh, AD 236 to 347. So this would have been kind of like, um, this is at the, the basal layer of the mound. So this is, you know, at some point during the construction. So um, moving on then from mounds, I'm not interested in mounds. Um, it's, it's kind of like, you know, uh, well, it's, it's, it's a thorny topic. Uh, tribes do not like people digging on the mounds. Um, I'm happy to avoid trying to investigate the mounds anymore. Um, I was much more interested in kind of like household archaeology questions related to to settlement um, uh, because you know there's already been a lot of good work at the mountain you know, not as much on not as much on the settlement out at Letchworth so um, related to kind of like some of the questions that I discussed at the beginning I wanted to conduct really a large-scale um, remote sensing survey to see if I could find evidence for features under the ground then go ground truth them and see if I could find evidence for habitation out at Letchworth um, so I proceeded with uh, again with the help of, of Dan Bigman um, uh, proceeded with a large uh, graniometer or magnetometer survey across the site so covering a, quite a large area this right here is only one of the grids that I did um, there are others throughout uh, the site, but this is really kind of like the, the one with the best data. So I'm going to concentrate on this part of the site here. Um, so I excavated uh, nine one by two meter excavation units um, to ground truth some of the anomalies that we found in the gradiometer. Um, and then I expanded that into a four by four meter block excavation to kind of uh, see if I could, you know, find like walls and basically uh, figure out if we're dealing with an actual structure. Um, so again, this is uh, the remote sensing. So um, you can see how kind of my, some of my grids were laid out. Um, so gradiometer zone four, this is the one that I was talking about that's more productive. Um, we've got a couple of good anomalies here. You can see my excavations where I placed them. Um, so first we have excavating, excavation unit one. Um, and I'm really gonna focus on this and the block that was placed over it um, because what we saw here is, Go figure the, the first unit. It's like the exact opposite of what normally happens in archaeology, where you find something really important on the last day. Uh, the first unit that I put into the ground um, had this really cool uh, stratified hearth. So you can see one layer up here, um, or rather, sorry, you have the earliest layer down here. Then it looks like they filled it in with this kind of like light colored sand. Um, and then a second layer right up here. Um, and uh, what's really interesting is that the the bottom layer looks to be kind of like devoid of rocks but we actually have quite a few hearth rocks in uh the this uh you know more recent layer um so those those rocks will be somewhat important later um so you know put a pin in that um also evidence of some nice uh some nice uh kind of narrow pits um <clears throat> so 
here is just the profile drawings for those uh, in case they weren't clear enough. Um, and then I expanded this unit out into a block. So this is that four by four meter block that I had mentioned. Um, so here's kind of the layout for that. Um, and it really uh, interestingly too, you know, I was doing a lot of this field work um, in the late months of 2019, the early month of 2020. Everybody knows what happened in March, 2020. So uh, I had a lot of volunteers um, from PAST, so another FAS chapter uh, in Tallahassee that helped me out a ton um, throughout the first kind of like three, uh, three and a half months of my field work. And, or I guess that's two and a half months, right? Yeah, so almost three months of my field work um, just had like, you know, dozens of volunteers out helping me. It was great. Um, then COVID hit and, you know, didn't want to get anybody infected and stuff. So I canceled all the volunteer work. Um, and uh, so I, I was kind of working by myself really when I excavated this four by four unit. So this is kind of my home away from home, the little tent built over that four by four unit. And I dug this basically all throughout April, which if you'll remember is the only month that Florida was actually kind of like shut down during COVID. Uh, so it was a very tranquil, tranquil way to kind of like get out of the house and keep myself sane during the, uh, the one month of, of Florida lockdown uh, in 2020. Um, so anyway, when I excavated um, the, this four by four block down to the same level that I had started to see features in unit one, I noted some patterns popping out. Um, for instance, it's kind of faint, um, but you can see, I think you can make out this like arc of really um, kind of like narrow and faint posts going right along here. Um, you can see it here uh, as well. Um, so uh, excavating this out and kind of like drawing the plan map, it looks like we have um, what I think is, is a structure, a pretty good candidate for a structure. Um, so we've got this central hearth. Um, we've got what looks like some pits um, surrounding it. So this, the definition for some of these features, especially 58 gets a, a little bit better as I kind of like shave down a little bit more. But, um, you know, this is a, uh, yeah, I feel like a, a pretty good candidate for a structure. You've got all of these uh, small little post holes. Um, then you've got an area of these of these pits surrounding the hearth, right? And then I dated 10 features, including three of the post holes, most of the pits and both stages of the hearth. And the dates kind of just like slap right on top of each other. So I feel like it's a, you know, that, that also backs up the interpretation that this is a single structure occupied for like a single phase, all the, all the features are line up, line up right together. Um, have, have pretty extensive overlap. So here's the three post features that I, uh, that I dated. So you can see their associated dates there. Um, and then here are the two stages of the hearth um, and then some of the, uh, some of the pits. Uh, you can see the dates for those. This one um, was a little bit later than some of the rest. I, I was able to actually luckily redate that feature and uh, pull it a little bit, uh, the, the, the second date that I got out, I pulled it a little bit closer in with, with, some, of those other, with some of those other dates too. Um, so what it looks like based on the excavations um, in this four by four block is that we have a roughly circular structure about four and a half uh, to five, really closer to four and a half meters in diameter. Um, these are small diameter, uh, less than 10 centimeter, um, less, less than 10 centimeter wide, uh, poles um, set around 25 to 30 centimeters apart. So indicating that we have like what's called a bent pole structure. Um, so instead of having basically like, you know, rigid single set posts in that are forming kind of like a sturdy rigid wall um, with like a gabled roof placed on over top. Instead, you're, the, the wall and roof are all one, all one structure. You're, you're taking these bent poles, saplings, and you're tying them together at the top or looping them in some way. And it's forming this kind of like tensioned, like single wall roof structure, like a dome. Um, and you can really only do that with these kind of like small diameter posts, uh, poles instead of instead of larger posts. Um, I also found some evidence of later disturbance. Really unfortunate. Let me flip back re, uh, right here. So down here in this kind of southwest corner of uh, of the block, you see that big kind of blob there. Uh, it looks like some kind of tree throw or something like that. Actually, like ripped out probably a third of the structure, which is really unfortunate. Um, who knows what features got kind of pulled out with that. Um, but I excavated this down and yeah, I got a date on it too. Um, there was there was one, what seemed like later kind of like, you know, Weedon Islandish date. Um, I also found some Weedon Island pottery in it, um, but I also got a modern date. Um, so I feel like it's, you know, maybe like, I, it's, it's hard to tell 
when the actual disturbance dates to because I've got you know modern and kind of like later prehistoric stuff kind of all mixed in. Um, but I'm you know I'm I'm pretty sure it's probably some kind of natural disturbance like a tree throw, maybe erosion, something like that. Um, Diagnostic artifacts from block one uh, from within the structure. So we've got um, a lot of the stuff seems to be domestic. Uh, a lot of it is, is you know, normal domestic artifacts that are associated with woodland period habitations. You've got a lot of lithic debitage. You've got some um, projectile points, uh, broken ones anyway. Um, so this is a Tallahassee point up here. Um, it's frequently mixed up with like a Santa Fe, which is I think like a early archaic point type. Um, but no, this is a, this is a Tallahassee. Uh, which is noted to be kind of like a, you know, a Swift Creek, basically uh, projectile point type, as well as a, the base of a Gadsden point right here. Um, then we've got a bunch of stamped pottery, uh, including some of what looks like, uh, like, you know, uh, Deptford or Gulf check stamped, a lot of stuff with scalloped rim. So I'm thinking based on the art, or I was really thinking that based on some of the artifacts here that we were dealing with early Swift Creek, late Deptford. Um, so I was, thinking that the date range would be maybe around like, you know, like 8300 or something like that. Um, we'll see that this, that the, the structure actually dates a little bit later than that. So, um, you know, some of these like archaeological constructs, the, the phases that are defined on the basis of, on the basis of diagnostic artifacts don't always, don't always line up. Um, so um, here's just a rundown of, of the, uh, the artifacts that I did find in block one, you see some examples of the stamp types here, including this one where it looks like you have the edge of the paddle right there on it, which is pretty cool. Um, but the artifact densities uh, compared to other stuff is pretty low. And I'll, sh and I'll demonstrate that uh, in here in a couple slides, um, just how low the artifact density is here. Um, but yeah, a lot of these artifacts look like they're domestic, normal stuff that you'd find at a woodland period habitation, just doesn't seem to be a lot of it, right? So um, in terms of interpreting, the block one structure, as I mentioned, it's a bent pole construction. I'm like, I don't have the data to basically uh, say one way or the other um, what it was covered with, but uh, I think it's, uh, you know, likely that it was like roofed with palmetto thatch, something like that. Um, as I, as I mentioned, the artifacts in interior storage. So we have some of those pits, which I think are probably into the evidence for interior storage, um, point to a domestic use because like some other, there are other structures that uh, that kind of look like this, this bent pole construction. So like sweat lodges are a good example, but um, normally don't have a lot of domestic artifacts in them and normally don't have evidence of storage inside them um, either. Um, also, a lot of them are a, a little bit smaller than this one is. Um, but, uh, but I think it's most of this stuff points to a domestic use. But I also think that a ceremonial use is, is kind of likely too, because we're talking about a large ceremonial center, potentially one of the largest ceremonial centers, at least in terms of monument construction in Florida, right, in the region, um, it makes sense to me that uh, that any domestic structure would, you know, be pulling dual duty as a ceremonial structure at times too. So if you've got, if you live in a house that can double as a sweat lodge on occasion, why wouldn't you use it as a sweat lodge sometimes? So I don't, I don't necessarily think that this like dichotomy between sacred and secular really works out uh, super well at a lot of these ceremonial centers. Like that's a that the that's a, a a dichotomy on the basis of ceramics. That's you know, like William Sears. I that's a, that's a ceramic thing that I think has been maybe like kind of like uh, that dichotomy has been in a lot of ways maybe like uh, expanded beyond its the, the conceptual bounds to be used as kind of like a, a a structuring metaphor for like woodland period society. I don't I don't really buy that. Um, especially when we have evidence for ceremonial centers with villages at them, people people living um, in like in direct proximity to um, to you know burial mounds, ceremonial plazas, things like that. Um, anyway, getting off my soapbox uh, here, um, this structure is also very interesting because it re it it resembles pretty closely um, what later Appalachian houses uh, were described as by um, by some of the. Um, like Spanish conquistadors that came with uh, Nervaez and DeSoto, right? Um, so they're described as being covered with hay or palms and straw, kind of um, almost like described as like little dome, like little little domes, whatever of, of, of straw and thatch. Um, and this is in contrast with houses farther north that are noted to be like caves and are semi-subterranean kind of like pit structures, or at least the winter houses are, right? Um, and archaeological evidence, I think from Mission San Luis, um, indicates that Appalachian houses were kind of of similar size 
um, around five to seven meters in diameter. So, you know, a decent amount bigger than this one, I guess. Um, but, uh, but, you know, similar construction. Um, so in terms of comparing the, the block one structure, um, I recently published an article kind of, kind of looking at this um, in comparison with, uh, with other woodland period domestic structures. So here are some examples. Here's Letchworth down here um, with some of those features kind of like cleaned up a little bit. Um, and then here are some of the other examples. So you have one from Kolomoki, um, a semi-subterranean pit house, one from uh, McKeithen and a couple from Block Stearns. Um, so these are, you know, other woodland period ceremonial centers in the region, uh, most of them inland, uh, because, I mean, it's kind of a, a bummer, but the, the best uh, evidence for domestic architecture that we have at these ceremonial centers is coming from the areas where we have the least evidence for basically village life, which is inland rather than on the coast. Um, so uh, Letchworth's structure, this block one structure is intermediate in size. It was likely large enough to house a nuclear family, uh, but it's more lightly constructed than these other structures. So you can see comparison of the size of these post holes. So this is um, these small post holes used for a flex pole structure. A lot of these other ones are larger, probably would have been a kind of like rigid single set uh, walled with a gabled roof. Um, and um, I also, as I noted, the artifact density at Letchworth is just much lower than a lot of these sites. So I think those two things together indicate uh, potentially like greater mobility for the people at Letchworth. Um, so people moving around a little bit more, we're not talking about a sedentary, a sedentary village as much. Um, <clears throat> uh, we also see more uh, interior storage features at Letchworth. So, um, you know, a lot of these have none. Uh, and uh, I think this indicates uh, so a, a focus on kind of uh, greater control over uh, household resources on the part of the household itself, rather than kind of like uh, pooling or sharing uh, on a kind of like communal basis with neighbors and things like that. Because, um, you know, based on the, the remote sensing data that I have, um, the Letchworth structure here, um, that hearth that pinged the, uh, that pinged the gradiometer, um, it was pretty isolated. There weren't other, there's not other structures uh, nearby um, on the basis of that data. So you wanna talk about kind of the ability to pool resources with your neighbors, what if you have no neighbors, right? Or not any that are living, you know, within a, you know, a couple minutes walk of you, right? So if you want uh, to see more, um, one second, I'm gonna, uh, I can't do that here. I was going to try to put this in the chat, but if anybody wa wants, they can ask me. I'll just put it in the chat at the end of the talk um, if anybody wants. It's an open access article on American antiquity. So if people are interested in reading more about this, um, you can you can find it there. Um, so, um, so as I mentioned, the uh, the artifact density at Letchworth is very, very low. Um, so this is just a, a comparison. You can see Letchworth here, here. Um, you can see how low the artifact densities are, com are compared with some of these other sites. Here's just a comparison with um, some areas at Kolomoki. Some of the lowest density areas at Kolomoki, I should note. Um, here's block one compared to just like, you know, test units that we put in the south of Kolomoki. Um, it's like a third the artifact density. Um, it's, yeah, the artifact density at Letchworth is just, is just really, really low um, by, by kind of like any measure. And I think it's pretty reasonable just based on, so again, talking about this, the settlement, data that we have to say that Letchworth is probably not a nucleated village. Um, you know, it's, it's nothing like Kolomoki, it's nothing like Crystal River. Now, moving on to subsistence, this is where things get a little bit trickier. Um, the data is not as, uh, or wasn't as clear, I think up until recently, it's maybe still not as clear, but we've got some really cool stuff. This is pretty recent. Um, so uh, the preservation at Letchworth is really poor. This is like basically um, like, it's like beach sand almost. Um, so it's like very nice to dig. You can make very clean, very clean walls, things like that, but the preservation is awful. Um, there's very little bone that preserves there. Um, and there's only a moderate amount of charred plant remains. So, um, I excavated 34 square meters of the site. Um, so this is, you know, a pretty, pretty decent amount of excavation. I only recovered 26 grams of charred faunal bone. So I could fit all of the bone that I excavated from 34 square meters, uh, in the palm of my hand. And it's all super burned and fragmentary. It's really difficult to ID. Um, charred botanicals are more kind of like uh, uh, 
more present, I guess. They're they're ubiquitous across the site, but they're not uh, particularly dense in any ever, any any area of the site. Even in that large hearth that I excavated, when I tried to float the the soil samples from that, uh, it was just a plume of ash that came up in the uh, in the float bucket. It was it was super depressing. Um, but the stuff that I did recover, um, we have charred botanicals, including wood charcoal, nutshell, some possible river cane. Um, so what am I supposed to do uh, thinking about subsistence um, at Letchworth um, without any faunal and not that much botanical stuff, uh, at least macro botanical. So I uh, got some ideas from Poverty Point. Um, I had heard of this study, I think um, uh, Gibson talks about it in, um, in one of his articles uh, about like sedentism or something like that at Poverty Point and saying that there was evidence of starchy wetland tubers, so like American lotus, things like that, that were found um, preserved uh, adhering to poverty point baked clay objects. So the possibility that those objects were used as basically boiling stones for cooking. Um, and I got a brilliant idea. I had all these hearth rocks in the more recent, um, I shouldn't say brilliant, that sounds like I'm patting myself on the back too hard. I got the idea that I should test some of the hearth rocks um, to see if I had any similar kind of like uh, microbotanical residues adhering to those that would provide evidence for um, for subsistence practices at Letchworth. Maybe I'd find something similar. Um, it's Poverty Point is also a large hunter-gatherer aggregation site. Why wouldn't I expect to find similar uh, similar um, similar types of, of data? Well, short answer is I did, um, which was, well, I should say uh, Mark Horrocks, who is a um, ethnobotanist who did the, the analysis here, found them, and I get to report them to you. Um, but uh, <clears throat> So this is, uh, this is very cool. Um, so you can see I've got like, you know, phytolists, blah, blah, blah. Like the phytolists don't tell us a whole lot. A lot of it is from grasses and, and, and um, what do you call it? Palms and things like that. We get over here to the starch. We've got um, some maize, you know, CF, so maybe maize, um, but it's in every sample that I tested. So I tend to think that either it's a mix up with some other kind of like starchy grass, which is possible. Um, or that it's some kind of environmental contamination. So I kind of just write that off. I don't think that we're talking about like super early maize cultivation at Letchworth. But what's more interesting is uh, to me anyway, is this uh, Nalumbo lutea. So this is American lotus. So we have the starch grains of American lotus. Uh, you can see here, um, these are found only in parts of the site where I was confident that there was evidence of habitation. So in the block one structure and a couple other areas of the site. To me, the fact that you have the, the, the fact that the uh, that this is showing up in some in places where I'm assuming that there's habitation on the basis of of artifacts and features and stuff like that and not in areas that I tested that turned out to be kind of like empty right that's a much better indicator that this is a cultural pattern and that this is not right um, so very interesting stuff here. Um, so if you're not familiar with American Lotus, it's uh, closely related to the kind of Lotus that you would see in like a hot pot, like a Chinese restaurant or something like that. If you've, if you've ever seen this. Um, so it's this large, uh, it's this large wetland flower. Um, but in addition to uh, popping out seeds that can grow new flowers, it also grows by this like large um, starchy rhizome that works through the mud, right? And it's, it's these kind of like bulbous, almost like water potatoes. Um, they're, you know, edible, they're nutritious. Um, you know, you don't have to leach them out like you do with some other starchy tubers. So I think it's like manioc or cassava or whatever. I don't know if that's the same name for the, the, the two names for the same thing. But like in South America, you have to leach those out because they can contain toxins, right? Um, Nalumbo lutea, so American lotus, is, you can eat it raw. Um, it's just, it's a very interesting plant. Every other part of the plant is also edible. Um, this is the same species that they found at Poverty Point in the, on those Poverty Point baked clay objects. So I'm super excited about this um, <clears throat> because it provides evidence of, of, you know, some kind of like subsistence practice going on at Letchworth. But I think what's even really more uh, kind of like more interesting for me is um, what's the relationship between wetland tubers and, and aggregation? The fact that we find it at a place like Poverty Point, there's also been evidence for starchy kind of like wetland tubers. So Sagittarius or Sagittarium um, found uh, at Crystal River, right? Um, you know, it's these large hunter-gatherer aggregation sites, some of which develop into villages, some of which don't, um, that you have basically people 
kind of collecting this starchy wetland resource um, that most importantly, because these grow through rhizomes can be intensified. Like you can break off parts of these and propagate them, right? Um, and so the idea that you could be seeing kind of like evidence for, you know, I, I can't like say this, like I don't have the data to say that they were act actively propagating these and like really intensifying production. Um, but the fact that we have a resource that can be used in that way and seems to be associated um, or at least resources like it seem to be associated with a lot of these uh, hunter-gatherer aggregation sites, I think is a really important kind of like uh, lead for, for future investigations. Um, so I can't give you kind of like a, a full rundown of kind of like, you know, a holistic view of, of hunter-gatherer subsistence at poverty, or sorry, at uh, Letchworth, but hopefully that gives a little taste um, of, of kind of like some of, you know, like, Basically, you have large groups of people coming together. You have a resource that you can get a lot of food quickly to, to meet those needs um, in, in an environment that's very close, i.e. Lake Mikasuki. Um, so basically to kind of interpret Letchworth for you, uh, especially related to settlement and subsistence, uh, Letchworth seems to be different from a lot of these other centers like Kolonoki, like Crystal River. Um, those were most likely villages. I, I totally buy that, but Letchworth is, is not. Letchworth is like very different. Um, so I see Letchworth more as a hub of interaction for a kind of dispersed and perhaps more mobile population that was probably living in little settlements dotted all the way around Lake Mikasuki. So uh, a kind of like dispersed low density settlement pattern instead of a nucleated village, right? Um, and really importantly, the, the as I mentioned, the environment is, is highly productive. Uh, you can have kind of boom and bust cycles with those like periodic uh, draining of the lake, which might be a reason um, for people to kind of maintain a more mobile lifestyle. Um, if you have basically that kind of um, almost uh, like inconsistency in the environment or volatility, I guess. Um, so, uh, you know, the use of intensifiable wetland resources. Uh, so like American Lotus, uh, possibly related to large scale aggregation. So the ability to get a lot of food um, for people that would have gathered at the site periodically for ceremonies and mound building and stuff like that. Um, like, you know, we still have to deal with the fact that it's a lot of mound, it's a lot of mound to build with what looks like very few people actually living at the site. So um, the, at some points in time, there would have had to have been a lot of people converging on the site and how do you feed all those people? Um, maybe this gives us a little bit of an idea into how now. And then, uh, the other thing I think here too is that uh, ceremonial center development, and this is kind of the broader takeaway um, in the Southeast is probably related to cooperation and ritual aggregation instead of like circumscription and population pressure. Because, you know, the ability for people around Letchworth to live in this kind of like low density dispersed settlement pattern instead of a nucleated village indicates that there's not as much kind of like, you know, um, you know, population pressure and kind of competition between emerging basically polities on the landscape of people that are, you know, staking out and defending territory, right? I don't think that that's what's going on here. That's a, that's that's a process that we see in a lot of other world regions as it relates to the emergence of villages, but I don't think that's what's going on in the Southeast. I think the environment's too productive. Um, and I think it's, uh, there's all sorts of other kind of like, you know, uh, it's not just all ecological, there's also a lot of other kind of like social things going on that, that undermine the uh, a lot of those kind of like uh, competition and circumscri uh, circumscription based kind of like models of, of village aggregation. Um, so that is the basic takeaway. Um, I will stop there. Here's all of my acknowledgments. I'll take questions um, if anybody has them. All right, well, uh, thank you, Marty, for sharing your work. It was awesome and props on finishing that four by four by yourself. <laughs> uh, so I know we're already getting some questions in the chat. If you wanna take a look at those, I can, um, I can read them. Um, first is from Bob Austin. He says, regarding the uh, hub of interaction interpretation, is there any evidence for periodic aggregation of groups who would be interacting with one another? So that's a really good question. Um, one of the things that I still have kind of like outstanding, so I did get uh, I, one of the things that should be on this uh, acknowledgements page is, uh, is NSF. So I, I got a National Science Foundation uh, dissertation grant to help with answer some of those questions because I, I have asked the same thing. And uh, 
we're going to be, I'm working with uh, Neil Wallace and, um, to do a, an NAA study of a bunch of the ceramics from domestic context at Letchworth to see if we do have evidence for basically kind of like regional interaction and mobility uh, on the basis of some of those ceramics. So I can't say anything quite yet, um, but hopefully that's, that will provide some data in the future. Um, but there have been some um, in a larger kind of like region-wide NAA study uh, that involved like paddle matching and some other stuff um, that, uh, that Neil Wallace and, and Tom Lacan did, um, there are kind of like, you know, paddle matches and what looks like, um, you know, movement of, uh, at least paddles between, uh, or, or maybe pots, uh, between, uh, Letchworth and I think at least Block Stearns, which is really close by. It's near Tallahassee as well. Um, but, you know, I'm looking forward to see if, if we see more of that, uh, more of that type of data. All right. Thanks. And then uh, Anna Gingrich would like to know, uh, adding on Bob's question, how are you differentiating between low density permanent occupations versus episodic gatherings, like when people come together at the mound? Okay, so the, um, so how do you tell apart dense, yeah, like, so dense permanent occupation from smaller term periodic occupation? Yeah, low density permanent occupation versus more episodic gatherings. So the structure, I think provides um, some, I, th I think provides some of the best evidence, right? So that structure um, is, it looks like, if I can go back actually, um, and I'll get this off of the way so people can't see Bob's personal message. Oops. Um, the structure here is, um, yeah, so we have, we have these, uh, the two stages of that hearth um, are right on top of each other. And we also have evidence of some of these, uh, some of these posts that look like they may have been maybe like rebuilt in place or something like that. They're also just smudged in the sand. I can't really say for sure. But um, I think that what we see here is that um, this structure is probably rebuilt in place or maybe reoccupied, or maybe it was just occupied for a longer period of time and they needed to make repairs. At the very least, they put the hearth right back on top of where you know, the, the earlier stage one was. So essentially what I'm getting at here is that this, the evidence that I do have for habitation at the site seems to be very short term. And I'm talking about short term, you know, maybe a couple of seasons, maybe a year or something like that. Um, the dates are, the, the dates are, those are error ranges. That's just statistics of, of the stuff. Like it could be that all of this stuff, because ev all of the dates kind of overlap, that there might've been like, a, you know, a, a couple year period where this, where the structure was actually occupied. And I think that's the more kind of like likely uh, interpretation here. Um, so I don't really see a lot of evidence for kind of like, um, I don't see a lot of evidence for, um, one second, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm thinking, thinking more about the question as you're asking it, um, because, because, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these occupations are going to be like, you know, uh, short episodes, like all of these structures are going to be short episodes anyway, that's just kind of what you would expect from the structure. So maybe strike that. The, um, I guess that that one is difficult to tell. The, the biggest thing would be to to think about the models in terms of uh, in terms of high density versus low density, nucleated versus dispersed. And I think that's the that's the biggest takeaway that we can get from the data that I have right now. Um, in terms of kind of like periodic occupation, that's 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 difficult to tell apart from um, from uh, from kind of like low density continuous occupation, right? Um, there are some kind of like assumptions that are, you know, when I was talking about those theoretical models at the beginning um, that deal with that. And some of them have to do with uh, so intensifiable resources, for instance. So the fact that we have intensifiable resources means that it's probably these like maybe like short term episodes where people are gathering together in mass instead of these kind of like very small and like kind of like isolated gatherings in different parts of the site. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Totally, um, maybe not the most kind of like elegant way of, of differentiating those, um, but that's kind of where I'm at right now. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> All right, thank you. 
Anyone else have any questions? Um, anyone want to debate Marty? Can I, ask a, can I uh, ask a vocal question? Sure. OK. Um, I'm thinking social structure of either the village or a region. When you think of Weedon Allen, you think of, and it's a very um, focused on priests, not Mississippian hierarchical chieftains. So where's the burial mound? I mean, Weedon Island is supposed to be a focused, ritualized, uh, very spiritual uh, environment, or let's say, uh, let's say era. And in Letchworth, uh, you'd think, even though it's temporarily, uh, maybe because it's a temporary uh, regional village, it wouldn't have, but, you know, ritualistic burials was the signature of Weedon Island, and it, and it was carried on in the Mississippian as well. I'll just leave that as, as that. Yeah, so, um... So as I was mentioning, like we we don't really have any um, excavation, uh, like you know, a lot of excavation data from the mounds. Like I mentioned that uh, the the excavations that were used to kind of like reconstruct the um, the construction history of Mound One, um, but that's pretty small scale, kind of like coring stuff. And platform mounds usually don't have burials in, in them anyway. But when I did mention that there was a, uh, you know, Calvin Jones went out there and estimated that there were like twenty seven other mounds at the site. I would imagine that a lot of those were probably burial mounds. There is actually a part in his letter where he notes that one of the mounds that was bulldozed had, um, I think he said like human remains and negative uh, Crystal River negative painted pottery in it, in like the spoil of what was kind of like pushed aside, which is a real shame, but that would have, that's a burial mound that the previous landowner just bulldozed, right? Um, so we don't have any excavation data to be able to speak to, um, to be able to speak to kind of the, uh, I don't know, the uh, the kind of like, we can't basically describe what the burials would have looked like and what the kind of like, what those say about the social status of the individuals interred there uh, because we just don't have that data. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, there's definitely evidence for burial mounds out there and most of the mounds that are still out there that aren't the big platform mound are pro probably have burials in them, um, maybe, um, but uh, it's, it seems likely that some of them do anyway. Uh, but we just don't know enough about them because nobody's nobody's nobody has excavated them, and I would imagine that nobody will for quite a while. All right, thanks. The next question is about the uh, the source of the mound soil because I know you mentioned uh, three different construction events and maybe different soils and uh, different flanks of the mound. Mm -hmm. Where's that all coming from? <laughs> um, so there are. Uh, a couple of what looks like in at least in the lidar data some possible kind of like borrow pits that are that are nearby but with some of these i mean like the the sand out at letchworth has a pretty consistent color um across the entire site um you know maybe going down to the stream so there's a stream that runs right to the south of kind of like the current state park boundary um that basically defines the current state park boundary you could probably get some kind of like darker wetlandy um kind of like mucky soils that would be that would be that kind of like darker brown almost like black um so there's sources uh for soil around and i think that there is some evidence that there are like you know evidence for borrow pits nearby where some of that would have been coming from but it's also like there are a lot of mounds out there N not n a lot of them aren't very big but like there doesn't seem to be enough bear enough borrow pit for the amount of mound. And I think that's something that you see at a lot of southeastern mound sites. Um, so um, in, a, in, in a lot of cases, you know, I gotta, I gotta do one of these. Like, I don't know exactly where all of it's coming from, but we know where some of it came from or can at least infer where some of it came from. Awesome. All right, well, uh, I don't see any more questions coming in. So I think uh, we'll call it a night and, uh, just want to say thanks again, Marty, for sharing your research. It's awesome. And yeah, appreciate it. And um, I want to say, uh, you know, thank thanks for your questions. Um, and uh, especially the uh, was the, the the one that I that kind of tripped me up the Anna Gingrich's one. That's that's one that I'm going to continue to think about uh, because that's that's very interesting. So um, so anyway, thank you all for attending. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, have, have a wonderful night. Thank you.